everybody. In this online lecture, I'm going to derive the familiar, hopefully familiar, equation for work that we introduce and use in 1000 level physics classes. So first of all, I'm going to derive it in one dimension, um, and this is for one dimensional motion with a constant mass. Okay, so we're going to assume then that all the motion lies along the x-axis and that you might have some force that's a function of x, okay? And then via Newton's second law, f is equal to ma. Now, by the definition of an acceleration, the acceleration is the time derivative of the velocity. So we can write f is equal to ma is equal to m dv dt. Now, what we're going to do is take this equation, f equals m dv dt, and then we're going to integrate both sides of it with respect to x. We're going to integrate over some path, okay? And so we're going to integrate over the path from point A to point B, for example. So it's arbitrary. So we end up with um, f of x dx, the integral of that from A to B, is going to equal to the integral from A to B of m dv dt times dx. All right, now we're going to use a trick from our calculus class. Okay, and we're going to write dx as dx dt times dt. So you can see that both sides here are equal. Basically, I'm just multiplying by 1, which is dt over dt, right? But we have here dx dt, and that's equal to our velocity. So um, that would be dx is equal to v dt. Now you can also see that this is just the definition of the velocity, right? Kind of rearranged. So we have the velocity is equal to dx dt, and then we just multiply both sides by dt, and that, there you have it, okay? Okay, so we're going to plug that in to our integral. So we're still on the left-hand side going to have the integral from a to b of f of x dx, but now on the right-hand side, we're going to plug in for dx. So we're now integrating m dv dt times v dt. So now, instead of integrating over x, we're integrating over time. So what we would do is look at our clock and see what time it is when we're at point A and point B, and those would become our new limits of integration. So we're integrating from TA to TB, right? The time when we're at point A to the time when we're at point B, m dv dt times v dt. Okay, now this looks kind of complicated, but you can see that we have a dt up top and a dt down bottom, so we can cancel those out, right? And then if we do that, we're just left with m v dv. Now we've switched again, right? We've done a substitution and we've switched our integration from being over time to over velocity. And so what we would have to do is for our limits, plug in our velocity at point A and our velocity at point B. So we would have VA and VB and those would be our new limits of integration. And we'd be integrating over those limits m v dv. Okay, so same thing as on the previous slide, right? The integral of f of x dx is equal to the integral of mv dv. But now when we integrate mv dv with constant mass, we could pull m outside of the integral and we're just integrating v dv. And that gives us one half v squared evaluated over our limits, which are va to vb. So on the right hand side, we would end up with one half times the mass times collectively vb squared minus va squared. So this is the familiar formula that we have in 1000 level um, classes for the work, right? We have the work on the left hand side, that's the work from b to a, which is the integral of f of x dx, right? That's work. And then on the right hand side, we have the change in the kinetic energy. And remember that our formula for kinetic energy is 1 half mv squared. So it's the kinetic energy at b minus the kinetic energy at a. Now the units of work are newtons times meters. As you can see here, we have a force multiplied by a distance. So that's a newton meter or a joule. So the joule is the SI unit of energy. Now we can talk a little bit about units because it's kind of fun. That's the SI unit of energy, but in CGS, which stands for centimeters, grams, seconds units, right? Then the unit of force is the dime. So F is equal to MA, right? So in CGS units, M is grams. And the acceleration would be a distance per time squared, but it would be centimeters per second squared. So the dyne is one gram centimeter per second squared. So you could see that if you um, 
plugged all that in and did a conversion between dynes and uh, newtons, you'd see that 100,000 dynes is one newton. And in energy, the CGS unit is the erg. So one erg is equal to one gram times second centimeter squared over second squared. And that means that there's 10 to 7 ergs in one joule. Okay. Now in English system, the unit of force is the pound. One newton is about 0.224 pounds. And the unit of energy in the English system is the foot pound. And if you do the conversion, one foot pound is about 1.356 joules. And this is my favorite. I love to talk about this because it makes me laugh every time. My favorite English unit for mass is the slug. And one slug is about 14.6 kilograms. So that's a fun one. Okay, so I've derived the equation for work there in 1D. But you might be thinking, well, life isn't 1D. So what's up with that? We need a 3D derivation. Okay, so let's do that. Now, the problem is that in one dimension, we know that the acceleration is parallel to the velocity. And if your acceleration is parallel to the velocity, then that means that your speed will change, right? Because if it's pointing in the same direction as the velocity, the acceleration is pointing in the same direction as the velocity, that means that the object will speed up. And if the acceleration is anti-parallel -par or 100 degrees, 180 degrees off, from the velocity, then that means the object's going to slow down. But either way, if you're confined to 1D and you have an acceleration in 1D, then your velocity will change, which means your speed is changing. But in three dimensions, we don't know that, right? You could have a velocity and an acceleration that are perpendicular to one another. And in that case, your speed would not change, just the direction of the velocity would change. And so that changes our derivation for work. We have to prove that it's still true, okay? So let's go through that derivation, and um, we'll talk about that. So in 3D, your force is now a three-dimensional vector. I'm going to indicate three dimensions with the uh, arrows over the top here to indicate that it's a vector in 3D. Um, so f of r is equal to m dv dt in three dimensions. This is still true, okay? But now the velocity could be a three-dimensional vector. And so could the force. So now what we're going to do is we're going to look at our dot product there, okay? Because I'm still going to do the dot product with force with a little minuscule displacement in both dimensions or in both sides and then integrate that. So we have f of r dot dr would be equal to m dv dt dot dr and we're still going to use that same definition of our displacement. So if we take our little dr dt that would give us v and so rearranging there, we have dr is equal to vdt. So m dv dt dot dr would be m dv dt dot v dt. Now I'm going to integrate both sides. So when I integrate both sides, okay, on the left-hand side, I'm integrating from point A to point B. Now point A and point B are 3D vectors, and so I've indicated them as such in the limits. So we have f dot dr from A to B. And then on the right-hand side, I've got m dv dt dot v dt. I'm integrating over time, so my limits would be ta to tv. Okay? And that's the time that we're at point A to the time that we're at point B. So now let's stop here and just think about this for a second, because this is where we have to really analyze what's going on with the directions here. So we're looking at dv dt dot v. So just this part right here, dv dt dot v. Okay, now dv dt is your acceleration. So that's the same thing as saying your acceleration dot with your velocity. But now this is going to have a directional dependence to it because a dot v, if you worked that out for your dot product, would be the magnitude of a times the magnitude of v times cosine theta, where theta is the angle in between a and b. So this is going to depend on the angle between the acceleration and velocity. So how are we going to handle that? Well, what we're going to do is we're going to say that our acceleration has components that are both parallel and perpendicular to the velocity. So basically, we're just going to say, okay, now I'm going to rotate my coordinate system in some way, for example, such that my velocity is one of my axes. And now I'm going to then have an acceleration vector that would have parallel and perpendicular components to that velocity. And so I can rewrite A as the component of the acceleration that's parallel to b plus the component of the acceleration that's perpendicular to b. 
And that's always possible. It's always fine to rotate your coordinate system and do it this way. Or you don't even have to rotate it. You could just break it into its component parts, okay? So that means that a dot v could be written as a parallel plus a perpendicular dot v, right? That's okay according to our definition of dot products. And then we're going to use um, the distributive law here, or associative. I always get those two mixed up, sorry. Anyway, it's going to be a parallel dot v plus a perpendicular dot v, okay? I have noun issues, if you don't know me. Okay, so that I can write. Now, remember that by definition of dot product, perpendicular vectors, when you take the dot product of two perpendicular vectors, that is zero, right? Because it would be, say, for example, the first vector times the second vector's magnitude times the cosine of the angle in between them. But if those two vectors are perpendicular to one another, then that angle is 90 degrees and the cosine of 90 is zero. So that means that my a perpendicular dot v part, that's going to be zero by definition. So that means that a dot v, the total vector, is just going to be equal to the part of a that's parallel to v, a parallel dot v. Okay, so now let's take that back. We've got here our dvdt dot v bit. That's what we're worried about. And so we can plug in for that and say that dvdt dot v would be equal to dv parallel dot dt dot v, right? So only the parallel component of the acceleration is going to contribute. And then what that means is that we've got dvdt times v, right? So see here, I've dropped the vector signs. Now I'm just looking at the magnitude of that parallel component of my acceleration, right? The magnitude of a parallel. And that's only going to have a magnitude if it makes the speed change, right? If it doesn't make the speed change, then this dvdt will be zero, right? So if the speed doesn't change, if the magnitude of my velocity, in other words, which is what this is saying, if the magnitude of my velocity does not change, that's what this dvdt part is, then that is going to go to zero. So now I can uh, use what I know about my derivative, right? And I can say that dvdt times v would be equal to 1 half ddt of v squared. Okay, so now if you need a second, let's think that through. What would ddt of v squared be? Well, it would be 2v times dvdt, okay? And that's why I put the 1 half out front, because 1 half of 2v dvdt is dvdt times v. Okay, so if you need to pause it for a second and think all that through, then make sure you can, you know, follow that. Now, of course, if my speed doesn't change, the magnitude of my speed doesn't change, so if dvdt is zero, then the square of my speed, v squared, that's not going to change either, okay? And so this is still true. So I have one half ddt of v squared, all right? So it seems like a math trick, but I think... Um, I think it's pretty straightforward if you think through conceptually what it means. Okay, so using what I found on the previous slide, which is this, copied and pasted it to this slide, and now I'm going to plug this in. Okay, so I'm going to plug my dvdt dot v bit, I'm going to plug that in here, okay? But the rest of it's still going to stay. So that gives me m times the integral from ta to tb, of 1 half ddt of v squared times dt. Okay, so the m and the dt are still there. I still copied and pasted it, and then this just part sticks in. Okay, now that means that I'm going to be able to cancel out my dts. So I have one up top and one up bottom, and they're going to cancel out. So I've switched my integration here again from time to speed. Okay, and I'm going to integrate over the limits of VA to VB, which is the speed at point A to the speed at point B. And I'm integrating 1 half D of V squared. So this is D V squared. So if V squared changes, that's what this is saying. Well, if I integrate that, I'm just going to get V squared, right? If I integrate D V squared, I just get V squared. Because if I integrate any differential, just straight up integrate that differential. I'm going to get the thing back, right? Evaluated over the limits. So that means that I have 1 half mv squared evaluated from the speed at a to the speed at b, which gives me 1 half m times bb squared minus va squared. And that's the same equation. So 
reassuringly, <laughs> we end up with the same equation even if the motion is in three dimensions. Okay? Phew! Okay, let's take a breath. And now, let's think about what happens if we have a constant force. So we're going to have other lectures where we derive work for non-constant forces like gravity and springs and things like that. But first, let's do the easy one. Let's do the low-hanging fruit, which is if we have a constant force, okay? So if we have a constant force, we would write that force F as some magnitude, which I'll call F0, times the unit vector that the thing points in. And I'm using n hat here so that we can see that it's in some arbitrary direction. So this is the unit vector in an arbitrary direction. So on the um, left-hand side of the equation that I've been working so hard on deriving, we would have the work from B to A is equal to F0 times the integral from point A to point B of n hat dot dr. And I can pull the F0 out because it's just some number, for example. Okay, now, dr is going to be uh, the vector in 3D, a little differential step in each direction. So it would be, for example, written in our bracket notation, dx, dy, and dz. Okay, that would be the vector components. Now, point A would be the x, y, and z coordinates of point A, which I'll call xa, ya, and za. And point B would be the x, y, and z components of the uh, position, right? So xb, yb, and zb. Okay? So, now looking at this, I'd have the work from B to A would be equal to f not n hat dot, see these things are all constants, right? And then I'm doing the dot product with um, the differential uh, steps here. So that would be i hat, the integral from xa to xb of dx, plus j hat, integral from ya to yb of dy, plus k hat, integral from za to zb dz. Okay, so this is just breaking it all out. Okay. Now, if I integrate dx, I just get x, and then I would evaluate those limits from xa to xb. So that would be f naught n hat dot i hat times xb minus xa. But then the same thing could be said of the other two dimensions. So that would be plus j hat yb minus yb, ya plus k hat zb minus za. And you can see here that this is the definition of a three-dimensional displacement delta r. Delta r is the change in x times i hat plus the change in y times j hat plus the change in z times k hat, right? That's our definition of a displacement vector. And so what that means is that our work from b to a would just be our force, f naught n hat, with dot product of our displacement. And that's our definition of work from introductory physics, right? So here we could write this as the magnitude of our force times the magnitude of our displacement times the cosine of the angle in between those two things, okay? So, Hopefully, those derivations of those important equations from introductory physics make sense to you. Um, let me know if you have any questions, and I'll see you in class.